Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. My next two guests joined the cast of Guiding Light in 1998, where they first met. And this past September, they celebrated their 19th wedding anniversary. They are raising their beautiful daughter, Marley, together. And it has certainly been a very long time since I've spent any time with these two. And I couldn't be more excited to welcome them to the locker room today. Please welcome my good friends, Victoria Platt and Terrell Tilford. Hey. What's up? <laughs> hey, so we're in the locker room. room. We're in the locker room. Great to see you. I know you it doesn't too. smell like locker rooms. I remember. <laughs> right. That is so funny. I, I I told the story yesterday. Somebody tweeted me. Um, they saw something with the locker room, but it was L O C K E R, and I said, "Sorry, that's that's a very different locker room." <laughs> <laughs> Right. We don't so, want to be in that locker room. We don't want to be in that one. It's probably a lot more smelly than this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Terrell, you joined, I think, July, around July of 1998, and Victoria, October? I joined, well, that's when I, actually, July 22nd on my birthday is when they offered my contract, but I had joined, I had joined six weeks before then. I know it to a, I know it to a T. Well, that's, life. A good birth, that's a good birthday present. It definitely yeah, it changed was, your life. <laughs> yes. It was it was an absolute terrible day of shooting. And as I was heading home, I get a page from my agents. I was like, great, I'm being fired. So I answered the I called them back. They're like, hey, can you come up to the office? So I walk inside. I was like, Yeah, I know. I know it's terrible. This and that. They're like, so the show called. I was like, I know. And they're like, they want to know if you would accept a three-year contract. And I just could not believe it. Just changed <laughs> absolutely everything. So were you hired as a um, non-contract first, and then they brought you later? A I was hired later. recurring. I was I was still in grad school at Rutgers when I booked the gig. And yeah, um, I, I, recurred for, yeah, I recurred for about six weeks um, before they offered. I remembered Rutgers especially. And I, I don't live far from it now. I'm out in New uh, Jersey now. So OK. And, and Victoria, what do you remember about joining? So I you was, you both auditioned um, and screen tested or, or auditioned with Glenn Daniels, right? Glenn yes. was the casting director. Yeah, yeah. Glenn was the casting yeah, director. Yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah, and I came in. Um, my gosh, I, I get all of this so blurry. But I think yeah. it was. Oh, it's September. only yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was just a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I came in, I think, in a, a September and auditioned, and then uh, in October, they, I, I think it was toward the end, because actually I was also coming home, my agent had called me, I was living here in Los Angeles, and my agent oh. called and I said, we know you probably wouldn't be interested in this because you're in LA, but would you be interested in auditioning for a contract role on Guiding Light? And I said, you know what, my brother at the time was really, really sick. And I said, this would be a good time for me to go back home. And yeah, he actually passed. He made his transition soon after that. So I was glad I was home and could be there for my mom and the family. But also, you know, it moved me back to New York, which was. I, I mean, so many things it did for you, really, though. I mean, that's yeah. why. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> in, the, in, in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, did, did you know you were going to be a Spalding from the get go? Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. I remembered because there was another woman who was playing the role at the time and I knew that I would be coming in to replace her. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, and do you remember meeting for the first time? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who's going to go for uh, <laughs> uh, Yeah, Susan was uh, one of our uh, dynamic directors on the show. And oh, there so were three women. Two? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. And there were three women that came in and after each one, Susan would make some comments or something. And uh, when I walked in, I was like, but doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so after we did the rehearsal, uh, Victoria walked out of the room and Susan said, she is hot. <laughs> and uh, I was like, uh, Susan, you already got a woman, back off. <laughs> <laughs> That is so funny. I didn't realize. So you screen tested with each other? We yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. And, that's a great story, the, too. Yeah, the first time <laughs> I met him, because I was in my dressing room, well, in the dressing room that they give you when you're screen testing. 
and I'm in there and I'm running my lines and just going over stuff and I get this knock on my door and it's Terrell. It's like, hey, <laughs> how you feeling? Do you need anything? Do you want to run lines? I was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I wasn't thinking like that. I'm trying to get a job. He's already a contract player on there. He gets to play around and flirt and stuff. I'm going to get in my freaking hot seat. He's trying to get a date. She's like, yeah, you're kind of creepy right now. Uh, I'm good. I did not I'm like good. that. <laughs> That was so funny. I was good and I didn't need any help. That is true. That was true. So uh, did you know um, sort of the soap world or working in the soap world before taking Guiding Light? I did. Yeah. I'd been on, I think both of us had, but I had been on All My Children for- um, So Corinne was first. Uh, Corinne was first. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Corinne was first. And I was on that, on All My Children for a while and then I did other things on, I was actually on Guiding Light twice before that as I well. That. The very first time I played um, a, a runaway single mom who basically dumped her child in a trash can. That's and terrible. It's a My soap goodness. opera. What do you want? Yeah. Talk to a wow. So, and then the second time I was in Lucy's aid support group because Lucy got HIV, which was wow. really interesting. Wow. Lucy yeah. Cooper. And so then, yeah. I mean, it's so funny in, in just doing this show, I, I didn't realize how many, even on every show have had something on the show that they eventually got. So many actors started in a smaller role, a, a waitress, yeah. you know, a, a, you know, a bartender or something like that. And, and then they end up, that's great. Right. That's great. Yeah. What do you remember your first day nerves at all? Mine on Guiding Light? Well, well, yeah, on Guiding Light in Springfield. Um, no, I don't. I don't. Rem My memory is so, you know, oh, I it was only yesterday. <laughs> uh, no, I don't remember. Do you remember? You have a better memory than I, I do. I remember everything because also when I booked the gig, um, I asked if I could come and just watch the show being taped. So I came for about almost a week every day for about, about four hours. And then that way I got a chance to know every single crew person's name, the actor's name, I'd go home and, and look at the character, look at the actor's name because I didn't wanna get people's names wrong. And then another thing I tell other actors as well, I said, always know where the bathroom is. So, so, so by the time I started shooting, I pretty much, I, I knew my way around the studio um, a bit so it was great. It was wonderful. Well, but that's a really smart way to, almost like for any job, and I wouldn't just say acting. I mean, if, you, if you're if you able yeah. to spend a little time in that environment to know it before you get there, but yeah. especially with, you know, what you gotta put out every day in, in the daytime world. Yeah, and I just remember Jerry Verdorn being the very first actor to approach me and and introduce himself and say hello, and I was so, enamored because I was going, here's this iconic guy that I've watched off and on, you know, throughout my life or seen, you know, flash the screen. And here he was right in front of me and just the absolute, just pure gentleman, just the nicest guy. And it was, it was like, I was like, okay, he's setting the tone for what the rest of this experience is going to be like. So that mm -hmm. was, that was wonderful. And then it just trickled down from there, That's from, awesome. you know, from you know Kim Frank Grant, I mean everyone really. And you, you know, I was looking at it. I mean, you both worked with everybody. You really worked we with did. a great. I mean, yeah. being a Spalding, let alone you know Ron and Grant, Ron oh and Grant, goodness. Sydney Coleman oh was gosh. was your Annie, right? Sydney Coleman was Annie. Yes, and, Sydney Coleman. Was um, Annie. Uh, Peter Herman, Doctor yeah, Michael. Uh, yeah, I know. And then yeah. Amy, Amy and I became really great friends, which was like, they actually had started like writing things where we would, you know, it never happened <laughs> because both of us I miss, the show, but. I miss Amy Eklund so much. Oh, absolutely. I love Amy. She was one of the funniest And she and Michael together were oh, absolute my hysterics. gosh, it was hilarious. Yes. <laughs> She's funny I, in real life too, yeah. yeah. 
I wish I, I, I've lost touch, but I think she is, well, she was one of the funniest. She was so funny. Do you I also, look for her a couple times? Yeah, yeah. I look for her a couple times and I haven't been able to find her, but yeah. And it's a bummer when you can't. In today's world, you I, think it you is, can especially over, in today's you, world, you're just like, what? I know, you think you could find Take anybody. Twitter and IG and everything. It's like, <laughs> I should be able to knock on her door and go, hey, girl. <laughs> that None of those things which we had when we were on the no, show. No, we didn't like, have any like of that. None. none. Yeah. I mean, we it would have been a different... email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would have been a really, I, I think about that for a lot of actors uh, in the soap world because telling story, some of it good, some of it bad, you know, some of it controversial. If you saw people commenting on, you know, every outfit, every hairdo, everything, it, 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 it would be hard to, uh, witness yeah. hard to take in but the, the fans yeah. they they save it up for you so when they run into you on the street <laughs> or at, at one of those events they, they have a litany <laughs> of complaints <laughs> and <laughs> things <laughs> that they've been saving you know since your first episode to the last one that airs so they know, definitely do good. and <laughs> i wanted to say hello from a, a fan named clyde thurman who said oh, he yeah. met you he met you, Terrell, in Chicago, and Victoria was Doing there. Uh huh. And yeah. he, he said you were quite the gentleman, and and just wanted to say thank you and hello. Oh, so, thank you, nice. thank you, Clyde. Clyde was a uh, has been a, was a very special uh, you know mm -hmm. fan of mine, and so when I knew I was coming to Chicago, I actually reached out and like arranged for us to have breakfast because the guy had just been so supportive over the years, and much oh, like. You know, much like Gina Davis, um, Vita, oh, uh, Bettina, Bettina. I mean, you know, yeah. you know, there were just some people that were just, you know, always really stand out and supportive. So, you know, it's nice to every once in a while, you know, turn the tables around and be be their fan as well. When you make a fan in daytime television, you really have them for life. It really is a unique yeah. because you're in their living room. Um, uh, GT Lem was asking. Terrell, about your real life mother, what she thought of your on screen mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, Patron, you know, Patronia what, Perry, there was, I know, right? I know. There, yeah. there were some stern moments of my television mother that actually reminded me of my real mother. Patronia <laughs> reminded uh, yes. me of his mom. Yes. <laughs> 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 the, the stern moments were pretty dead on. Um, oh, that's great. And, yeah, and unfortunately, we didn't get enough of light moments with uh, Petronia, but um, uh, my mother saved those up for me, personally. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Um, oh, one yeah. of our fans just reminded me, Victoria, that you worked with Mary Kay Adams and Marge Doucet. I did, Alex that's right. Oh, and I don't know if you, Alex, uh, Marge had passed away earlier this year. Oh, I didn't oh, know that. Yeah. Oh, had, um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, so many she, people. She was, I know. She was a great lady. Great lady. She really was. We had a really good time. We had a lot of fun. Everyone there was wonderful. I mean, I, I can't, not like I would say it anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> hey, right. <laughs> just between us. Um, no, but everyone was really, everyone was really kind and warm. I remember we got to work with Sandra Santiago and, uh, uh, yeah, and, you were yeah. Right, you were involved. You were first involved in the clone, and then the Santos family. Oh my goodness! Santos family. Oh, the clone situation. I've forgotten about the clones. <laughs> <laughs> you forget about all of the things that you go through with the so. But yeah, every, and Sandra, of course, on the show was this like rough, you know, and off stage. We went to see her in a cabaret. That's right. She was just yeah. I might have been there with you guys. I think you were. Richard Gere was there that night. Richard we were Gere so excited. Was there. Yeah. yeah, it was really cool. So we're doing a benefit tomorrow, and she um, gave us a video, a Christmas song she recorded for uh, for oh. for another event, but she gave us, and uh, she's a great lady. I love her too. So and a talented. I mean, you she's the whole cast, talented. your whole cast. Yeah. I mean, you really. Um, do you remember, I mean, I just named some of the stories. Any stories that stand out that for you guys were? For me, for, did, for me, I have, think one of the. You guys, yeah, tell me that in a second, but then did you have a favorite scene of working together? Well, one of the most beautiful scenes that I've ever seen on television, period, was Amy Eklund's uh, episode 
when I think Aww. she had the cochlear implant yeah. and she comes home and Michael, she's letting the blinds and pulling the tissue out of the box and just oh. hearing things for the first time. I mean, that was the, one of the most touching things to this day I've still ever seen on television. Yeah, ever. that was beautiful. They, but uh, yeah. it was amazing they put it in. I think, um, sadly, dropped the boat. You know, like I think there was an yeah. opportunity to take that further. But Amy yeah. was. I remember Amy saying it. It was like turn, you know, turning like Chinese symbols to English that you know you could just. It was like, bing, you know, yeah. and oh, I, I totally. You just gave me chills because I, I remember. I mean, you and I, you know, the three of us spent a lot of time with Amy. And Amy, yeah. I mean being almost like completely deaf, I mean, was the most amazing lip reader that just blew yes. your mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Blew yes. your mind. So for both of you, who or what influenced you on becoming actors? That would have been my sister. My sister Valerie was in, um, she was in uh, Brooklyn College in the drama department. And one day she took me to school with her and I spent an entire day going to her acting classes. And they did the trust exercise where they had me in the middle and they would, you know, the trust exercise <laughs> basically where there's this circle, you stand in the middle and they just kind of push you and you're just supposed to oh. answer the trust exercise, you know? And we played all these theater games and then I saw her in a show at Brooklyn College called Working. And um, I just was absolutely entranced. And then my mom took me to an audition for Annie. And I was like, ah, wow. <laughs> and um, they pulled me up on stage and I sang there were literally 10 lines of like 10 girls. So there were like 100 girls on stage. And they would just, they would say in this big, huge theater in New York City, there you go. So when, with this big bullhorn, so when we point to you, sing eight bars of whatever's next. The sun will come out tomorrow. Like literally, it was like that. And someone would start playing. It's like a cattle call, like a real one. Oh, it was absolutely a cattle call. Really? It was, it was a yeah, real, like a real one. that's why they call them cattle calls. There was a line <laughs> outside the door. And we showed up at something like six o'clock in the morning. And um, and man, he pointed to me and I started singing and I heard this voice and I was like, that's me. And it was filling up the space. And I was like, I can actually do this. And I booked that job. They wanted me to be Annie. I actually booked Annie, but it was a two year tour on the road and they were only allowing a certain number of chaperones to go. So my parents were like, you ain't gone. <laughs> and I burst into tears and ran to my room, but that was the beginning. It was a good call for them. Wow. Who knows where I'd be right now? <laughs> That's crazy. I just um, Stephen Bergman just sent me a picture. I think of maybe one of Stephen your going away Bergman. party. <laughs> oh wow! Thanks, oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Stephen. That's so cool. Another great. That, that's a great um, story. He's a super guy. He, he helps me yes. out a lot because he he loves yeah. to think of people to book for the show. You know, he's been oh, doing awesome. this for a while. He's been doing this for so long. Yeah. Um, one of our fans, Benjamin, just said how he loved that period of Guiding Light because it, they were proud to see them activate the Black Spaulding family. Yes. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, when I came on, speaking of the first day, this is the one thing I do remember about my first day. They had told me that I had been living that I was part of the Spalding clan that actually was from the islands. Yeah. And yeah. so I had an accent and I started using my accent because I am actually West Indian. My mother's West Indian from the Bahamas. And I started using my accent and they came down for notes and they were like, Victoria, can you squash the accent? And uh, I was like, okay, so we're not ready. We're not ready for that much blackness yet. <laughs> okay, that's all right. <laughs> but I figured I'd try. <laughs> So, That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I was glad about that too. You know, I mean, it was, a, and I'm also glad they had pieces. We didn't completely address it, but there was like an episode where I yelled at them basically saying the reason that you don't accept me is because I'm black. Um, and I was yeah. really hoping they were going to go further into that conversation. Um, cause I was having an argument with Philip and, um, with Grant and Ron. 
right. Um, yeah. And Ron Ray. Ron Ray. Ron Ray. <laughs> Makes you smile, right? Look at he that. Does. Oh my God. Just He's such a every brilliant time. light. And he was always singing and he yes. had the most beautiful yes. voice. Um, yeah. But yeah, so he, they had you know, his, he, that scene. He did Daddy Warbucks. He yes. did do Daddy yes. Warbucks. Yeah. 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 You, perfect. You perfect Daddy Warbucks. I mean, perfect. Clearly. Yeah. Um, that's that's wild that they did address that. I mean, that's great that it was back in the nineties. It um, was. You know, to do that. Yeah. I mean, late late nineties, but still. I mean, it's yeah. important to to address that. Um, wow. And Terrell, for you about becoming an actor, who were what? Well, Stan Stanislavski was my great grandfather, and um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I go through this multiple times a day. A day. Yeah. He does a stand-up routine for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He tries out his material and I do this. I go like this, this, right. or this. When I was studying in Japan when I was seven. Please okay. stop. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. You, you sound like my best friend. He makes up these stories and then we all look and we're like, you're BSing us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Until right. uh, uh, until about five years ago, I actually thought he was he would go to what did you tell me Taipei Taiwan for Singapore for like camp <laughs> when he was a child. <laughs> I love that. That's great. <laughs> when I was about five or uh, no, about maybe six or seven years old, I saw a production of Hamlet um, at LA City College uh, here in Los Angeles, and from a theatrical standpoint that just sort of kind of blew my mind in a way, but I didn't, I wouldn't say it was the thing that thwarted me right in. It was just something that had like a sense memory that later on I was like, ah, back to that. But I think also just as a kid having watched, I watched a lot of television, but just one thing in particular just sort of uh, had an impression on me just very early on was seeing um, uh, Ruby Dionazi Davis and Sidney Poitier um, in, probably, uh, I guess it's coming to dinner uh, when I was really young. And it just absolutely, because it was dramatic and it was, it just seemed so honest and sincere. And I, I didn't know that these people would end up being the type of, I, I didn't know they were already iconic. And I didn't know that they would really have that sort of impression on me, but they did. And also because I learned later that they came from a theatrical, you know, stage, you know, training standpoint that's what delved me into the craft the way that i did do you know a little guiding light history with ruby d yeah was, they were she was wasn't she the first first black, black actress yeah yeah, yeah. it's not it's great uh, exactly. another another you know yeah. that one of the most awesome things about you know having been on guiding light is that it was the first you know thing on it started as a 15-minute radio show and then it was the first, you know, thing on on television, on broadcast television, whatsoever. So to be a part of that history is just absolutely, you know, it's it's like a, I don't know, we're, I, we're part of history, you know. Yeah. And that's, it really that's is. Cool. Did, uh, Victoria uh, G T Lim, our fan, was asking, did you like your clothes? Because he loved the the clothes that Vicky Spaulding got to wear. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, <laughs> when I left, I was like, can, can I, I have all of my stuff? <laughs> like, can you send my closets with me? Um, no, Sean, Sean hooked me up. Sean That's was like, I mean, Sean Reeves. Yeah. 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 And it is, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So wonderful. And he's a wonderful guy, too. But there, I don't know. This was one of the things about um, being on soaps that was really amazing. I mean, because some parts of what we do seem glamorous and are not, right? Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I loved was going shopping. Say, well, we need to go shopping. And they'd take you shopping with them. And we'd go to all these places and try and stuff on. And I was like, this is amazing. And I would look at price tags and I'd be like, ah! <laughs> I can't take it. It'd be like, as I am a klutz and I will absolutely ruin it. <laughs> but um, but no, yeah, the clothes were dope. And you both um, have done other soaps. And is it true you both got days at the same time? Like, Just about. We've actually she, had some really interesting like yeah. parallels of things. She, she kind of pitched me. Which birth, 
were you on at the same time for that too? No, we weren't, I mean, in the same time period, but not the same, we weren't in the same scenes. So I think I worked one period. week. Yeah. yeah, so I worked one, like a couple, I had been working since last year and then Terrell came on like maybe what, two weeks after I worked or mm -hmm. something like that, which was kind of, it was really Very odd. Good. But I did tell them, I was like, hey, but also Marnie Seda is there and yeah. Marnie, I mean, she's really wonderful. Yeah, she's been on the corner for her, years. And we've known, known her for, her for almost 20 years. Yeah, since New York. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but so Guiding Light in, you know, late 90s to what, 2001, and then now days in 2020, how have doing soaps changed? Whew. So <laughs> I think um, <laughs> it's like, love in the time of cholera, soaps in the time of corona. Um, I, I'm sure people have seen the, the mannequins happening with people kissing mannequins. So I came on actually right before coronavirus hit. So it was still really different then because where we were doing like what one show a day? One episode a yeah, day. Yeah, we were doing an yes. episode a day. Now it's not one episode a day. It could be two or three episodes a day. And yeah. you could travel back and forth in time. And it was really confusing for the first couple of days. I was like, oh God, what happened? <laughs> I it felt like really I was in fast. a completely new dimension. Yeah. Really, really quick. Um, Guy of Light eventually got to that too by the end. A lot of I, a lot of them to save, to save money really even, yeah, even yeah. when I went over to One Life to Live, uh with Frank Valentini over there, you know, we were pretty quick and Frank, boy, he was he was good for getting things under budget, under time schedule. Oh, yeah. I mean, Frank would just come right on the floor and just, you know, he would just direct from right there and, you know, we would just get it done. But but seeing what Vic goes through now and just, you know, my quick little stint last year with Days, I mean, you know, if you thought it was a hustle before, it is absolutely, no you know, it's no joke now. But Definitely. it's still, it's still fun once you get into because it's another muscle. You're just building another muscle, yeah. right? And so, um, I think there was one day that I came on and I had a phone call, and it was like three of them in a, like three scenes of the same phone call. And they we came on and they were like, "Hey, how do you feel about just shooting and not rehearsing?" I was like, yeah. oh, "Okay, <laughs> let's try it. See what happens." <laughs> but they're really like. It, you get a rehearsal and right before the rehearsal, they say, all right, so on this line, downstage right, on this line, sit in the chair, sit on the edge of the bed, on that line and end on camera one. Like, okay, let's do it. Um, and I actually found that to be a lot easier. It was less pressure. I mean, it seems like it would be more pressure, but you just don't hmm. have time to be, to be worried. You just don't have time to be worried. So you come as prepared as you can, and then you just so do you, it and have fun. And you are prepared. I mean, you've you know you've been doing it forever. You know now. You know. Yeah. If you you know having had that has helped. If you just got thrown into that, I bet it would be a lot scarier than. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> for for a newbie, a young person just coming in to like. Yeah, I'm sure would be, it's it would be rough. Yeah, I've also sometimes, scary. also sometimes, and I remember this even back with Guiding Light. Sometimes you'd have an older actor that has done, you know, they've been on Broadway, they've you know done all mm -hmm. this stage, and they've done episodic TV. And if they're they're coming around for their first round on on a soap, and the pages, and sometimes they've either been looking for a teleprompter or if they're playing <laughs> a judge, and you could hear somebody saying, "We can see the pages," or whatever. I'm going, "Oh my god." <laughs> and they're going, you didn't expect me to remember all these damn lines. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard some good stories about where people find a script or, you know, when oh, one yeah. of the shows went off the air, they found a hundred of them under the under the sofa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> under the sofa. Oh, always under the yep, sofa. Yes. Always under the sofa. Yep. Or, under the or it's under the mattress, yep. the pillows. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In drawers. Under the covers, drawers, everything. <laughs> yeah. Inside the folder, definitely. Well, women, we always have them in our purses. Right. And yeah, you you have you have a pl place for them. So, little six year old Marley, does uh, do you see her maybe following in either of your footsteps at this early stage? She doesn't. She doesn't know what we do. She doesn't know. Really? No. Not at all. But then I'm wondering if it's in her. If it's genetic, because right. 
she's really, um, we well, actually she, think she, she might be a comedian, honestly. She seemed <laughs> shy when I met her before the show. She's That's not. not <laughs> we actually, so, we actually like asked my mom. <laughs> yes, we asked my mom to keep her away because otherwise we would just sit here and yeah, she would. She would. While still Marley show. ran everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She is. I. I never thought that we could probably have a kid that is absolutely as completely not so hysterical as she is. But I'm telling you, she keeps us constantly on our toes. She drives him crazy. Oh, yeah. She uh, drives him uh, crazy. I've let it go because I'm like, I'm just okay <laughs> with having one of the. I'm. I'm okay with being one of those parents I used to judge. And then saying, why don't they contain their child? Why don't they have, she, that child doesn't have any respect. That child doesn't know boundaries. You know, I'm like, I'm okay with her not having boundaries. I'm okay with her being disrespectful. Because she has, absolutely, she has no fear of me None. whatsoever. So this is brilliant. The other day, she's sitting at the table. And Terrell says, she's just had like some snack or whatever. And Terrell says, Marley, you, you need to put your spoon and your bowl in the sink. And she saunters and she looks at him and she goes, No. And then bursts into laughter. <laughs> and I could not stop laughing. Sorry, my phone is ringing. Uh, I could not uh, stop laughing. So now Terrell is, and now he's like, No, Mark, because now you're going to dig, got to dig in in that moment. You got to get some respect and show them who's boss. I was like, Don't do it to yourself. <laughs> Consider this the L. This is your L, man. She, 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 it looked like, you sure you want to do this? <laughs> you do? And Marley's she, over on the. She's making up there. stories like you do. Oh, oh. totally, totally, one hundred percent. She does. Yes. She actually practices in the tub. I've taken video of it because it's just hilarious. That sounds weird. Oh yes, <laughs> strange. Huh? I'm not a mom. I can do that. I'm not hosting. Oh, it. Right. That's but a different. That's a different. No one's story. ever going to see it. Yes. Right. <laughs> but she she practices being on her YouTube channel. Mm. She's like, so hey yes. everyone. I've got dolls and we're going to play with slime today. And so if you see the subscribe button, click subscribe. Yes. And if you don't, oh, well, you're missing out on really <laughs> great stuff. So da, 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 da. it's all in, not yeah. knowing that I'm there. Yeah. I completely she, engaged. She did let me be in an episode about two or three weeks ago where I was her assistant. <laughs> I, I will eventually uh -huh. show a piece of that, but yes. Oh, she awesome. realized you're on YouTube now because you remember Lisa who worked with me in PR? Lisa, yeah. is, Lisa's son thinks I'm like the most famous person in the world because I'm on YouTube. <laughs> and I, you know, it, it's like these kids think YouTube is like this I God. Know. It's really them, like, I, it is. Yeah, it is. I guess, like, it, you know, especially now. Sick. And she's, you know, she's telling you she's on YouTube. I mean, she's like, that's I'm on YouTube, telling her <laughs> followers to click the subscribe button. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how did how did um, parenthood change your lives? <laughs> <laughs> that's a trick question. <laughs> that's a trick question. Oh gosh. Um, I don't know. It's probably one of the craziest rides. Like you think that there are things that are important and then you have a kid and it's like, oh. And it's not to say that it's the best thing that we've ever done. Cause there are moments when I'm like, why did we do this? <laughs> this so that's, an, that's, an honest, that's an honest parent though. I mean. Oh no, it is. That, I, you I know, don't feel ashamed moments. of that. No, I think, there are ridiculously hard moments. I, I think also you just, you, there are parts of us that we see in her, but then there are so mm. many independent parts of herself that are new discoveries for us that um, I think it's just, I think it's just an amazing journey to go, wow, man, the universe allowed us to, you know, shepherd a kid into this world. And, you know, now we're learning from her mm -hmm. um, more about ourselves on a daily basis. That's the hardest well, part of it. Yeah. The hardest part of it is that the things that really bother us about her, the things that really get under our skin are the things that we probably haven't synthesized as adults that happened to us when we were kids. That's mm -hmm. the hardest piece because then it has nothing to do with her. Right. It has nothing right. to do with what she's doing. It has way more to do with how we're being triggered 
And then because we're adults, we get to go, no, you fall in line, you be controlled, you do this and listen to what we say because we're your parents. But the real thing that you're being called to do is go, okay, what haven't I worked through? What haven't I processed? Where do I need to grow and stretch? What do I need to synthesize and heal? What trauma did I experience that won't allow her to have this expression? It's the hardest piece of it, honestly. But to realize that having is, to take down. I mean, the fact that you're just even speaking of that is an amazing thing because so much of everything that we are is our previous, our parents, yeah. our lives. Absolutely. You know, Terrell and I were talking a little backstage. You know, there are things from your childhood that just stick with you. Um, and, and I I wanted to bring up because I mean, here you are raising a six year old in th this crazy world today. Um, and the Black Lives Matter movement that just transpired and having uh, a vice president elect who is half black and half Indian has got to, you know, put, you know, I see your beautiful smile, Victoria. It's got to be yeah. to have a daughter, you know, for her to see that, you know, if you could talk about all of that, because I, I was saying to Terrell, I don't fully understand, you know, as a child, what your parents have to educate you on on how to survive in america and it is crazy to me that in 2020 we even have to have the conversation but i think the conversations are the most important things because i'm still learning about my own life you know my family's history today in 2020 through listening reading and you know, I have no idea what other people have lived through. And I think it helps us to be better human beings, in my opinion. I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think the, so first I wanna share, I am thrilled about Kamala Harris <laughs> being the vice president, thrilled. And people say, well, because I also agree that if you're a politician and you've gotten to that place, to some degree, you've played the game, right? Um, but in terms of visuals, image is really, really important. Images are powerful and they tell you what's possible. And for young black girls to see that image in that position is incredibly powerful. It shifts their paradigm in a way that I don't think any of us really will understand until we see this crop of kids grow up and mm -hmm. see what they achieve and what they become because they already now have an image of that. You know, I remember on um, Instagram and all these social media platforms where there was the, the uh, uh, an image of, um, oh my gosh, just blanked on her name. Ruby, Ruby Bridges, thank you. Image of Ruby Bridges and then image of Kamala Harris, both walking, right? And oh yeah, 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 yeah. It just was one of the it's most the powerful- breathtaking. My gosh, just incredible, right? Um, but then also, just a couple of years ago, I was driving in the car with Marley, and you know, I know everyone has heard parent, black parents have the talk with their kids, and I think yeah. we always think you're having the talk more with the boys, but you have to have the talk with the girls as well. And we've seen with Sandra Bland, clearly Breonna Taylor, and all of these other women who have been um, murdered. Um, you have to have a talk with the girls too. And so I'm driving around with Marley, who is three and a half at the time. So she's got words, she's got language, she's got content, concepts and context, right? So she understands things at three and a half. And we're driving and I see a cop pull over a man, a black man on our street, which is odd because where he would have pulled him over would have been fine but he's this is now inside a neighborhood kind of far away from all the other stuff going on and i was concerned and so i just pulled over and i kind of just sat there and marley said mama why are we stopping and i said well a cop just pulled someone over and i just want to make sure everyone's having making good choices and i'm thinking that's going to be in be the end of it and she not, says not to me, with a three -year -old. No, not with a three -year -old. <laughs> and she says to me, oh, is it because he's black? And even now in the moment, and I get teary because the fact that she had that understanding at three and a half years old, and not when we had been having conversations around her where we're, you know, 
talking a lot about it in the way, when we talk to her about it, we want to talk to her about it in, in responsible and age appropriate ways, right? Which we're still right. learning what that even means with this child who acts like she's 50. But um, in that moment, I realized, wow, so we have to have a, a conversation with her. So one, she doesn't fear the police. I don't want her to be afraid of cops or think that they're all bad, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also the realities of the world we live in, that's a conversation we realized we needed to have. And so we had it with her at three and a half years old. And it's necessary. And I'm also really grateful for where we are right now. It's been a long time coming. And it's not like this just got birthed. It's not like, oh my God, yeah. where did this crazy racism come from it? From Mars. No, it didn't actually. It's been here. And it's been lying in wait for fertile soil. And in my opinion, this administration gave fertile soil. So that is I, I will not disagree. <laughs> yeah. So could not I think, disagree. And it's wonderful to have it go ahead and blossom so we can dig it up from the root, you know, where it is. As and I said to Carell, I may not be black, but I am Jewish and I am gay. And this, you know, there's been a lot that I've witnessed this year, but also, you know, you, you say representation. I mean, Ellen DeGeneres, really her, her sitcom for me, I was Absolutely. probably in my twenties. So I didn't see any of that until, you know, that point. And, and we've come a long way there too, but Absolutely. you know, it's still not, still not, you know, where we should be on both conversations. And that's why, you know, but it's, I mean, three and a half like it's just where did you know where do you think that just just witnessing her life around her and being a smart young woman <laughs> yeah but also you know. i think there is i mean there are studies done often about um epigenetics which to me translates into ancestral memory um proving mm -hmm. that there are things that we have an understanding of and uh we don't completely know why but there are things we just, we do kind of instinctively, you know, it's sort of like a giraffe building a really long neck because it developed that way because it needed to get to high leaves. Right. But for us, it's translated, I think, into something else, which is sort of a, a, somehow an innate knowing of our, um, I don't want to say fragility. We're not fragile, but of our position. And I think when we hear certain words, it triggers an understanding. That's what I think happened with her because they, these weren't conversations that we were having. I know this may sound esoteric, but it's stuff that we talk about right. often in our home. And yeah, uh, and kids hear things and they you think she's watching TV or she's watching YouTube, but her ear heard exactly what you were saying and just right. And she tried, wow. she synthesized it and processed it and was like, "Oh, this connects to this," mm -hmm. and got it oh, we're here because that's a black man and that's a cop and that's not a good situation in our understanding, right? I can't that's even imagine your reaction. Fact. That throws up red flags, yeah. And the thing is she, she asks a lot of questions now and then we were very fortunate that though school was compromised with, you know, you know since the, the second half of her kindergarten, then moving into first grade that these kids, you know, they're just sequestered at home with Zoom learning what have you, but we were very fortunate that even even her primary teacher, you know, um, sort of really picked up the baton when it um, when it came to oh, the George yeah. Floyd protest, the Breonna Taylor, you know, everything that when we were in this really heightened sense of the social injustice movement this summer that, you know, we were just, I was like almost in tears off to the side, just hearing how her teacher really addressed these things to first graders. Yeah. You know, and you're going, God, it's it's sad that, that they have to, actually it was she was still in kindergarten at the time. Yeah. And just going, yeah, yeah. And just saying, you know, how sad that we have to be addressing this at such a young age, but we were also fortunate that there was vocabulary and a constructive context at which it could be discussed. And that way we're dealing with the uh, social emotional learning of the children as well, because one they're sequestered because they're supposed to be on the streets, on, on, on the playground, running around together, mm -hmm. what have you. So they're in this, now they're in this box, you know, dealing with 12 other little kids that are, you know, all feeling some kind of way about what the what is happening in the world. And, you know, it was just a beautiful lesson, even for us, 
to just hear how she responded and the questions that she interacted with in talking about it. So then once she got off of that, for us as a family to have a conversation too, was very constructive. That teacher sounds incredible. Totally. The school we're in is bomb. Yeah. They're amazing. I mean, because, yeah. really you know, it is important that they learn, you know? That's a- Absolutely. 100%. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow. And I mean, I'm grateful we don't have, a. I mean, I know Terrell might disagree, but I'm grateful we don't have a son. That's a whole other conversation, right? Because as much I, as I, I, I hear that a lot. Like to be I hear a black that a lot. Woman, yeah. I don't know what it's like to be a black man. I obviously have a, a husband who's black and I have brothers who are black and friends and that whole thing who are black men. But I can't possibly understand that is a totally different weight. That's a different oh level God. of trauma and constantly feeling like you are in unsafe situations. Like that is just. Well, for, for your child, uh for your child and then you both as the parent worrying yeah. about that 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 yes. young man being out on yeah. the street yeah. is something yeah. I, I i i feel it i can't even think you know what that yeah. has got to, i mean do you remember conversations your parents had terrell not really like that because um my mother worked eight to 16 hour days and i was pretty much left alone by myself a good deal of the time at home uh, from a very early age, you know, I was sort of raised by all of the neighbors. You know, we didn't, we had these concerns, um, but not in the same way. Although I do have my own private story of, and we can always indulge this later, but um, I was picked up at 10 years old by undercover uh, LAPD detectives um, and interrogated for six hours before I was interrogated did the perp walk, processed everything before they even called my mother. At 10 was, years old. 10 years old. So when you talk about childhood trauma and you know all of those things, it took me years to even actually understand it as trauma because I kept thinking, oh, I'm over it. I got over it. That was I was 10 years old, 40 years ago, whatever. But I'm going, no, there are things that come up all the time for me that harken back to that. You know, and then when I just think about my episodes over the years between junior high, high school and college, even um, my interactions with cops and, you know, it's it's just a, a almost like a never ending stress level. So it, it, and if you don't understand it, if you don't have some sort of context for it, you're wondering why this thing keeps eating at you or why you keep having these knee-jerk reactions to something so you know it's a it's a constant conversation unfortunately wow crazy um but thank you for for being honest because i do you know i really do think it's important to talk about you know because yeah. even if one person learns something it's worth it because yeah Absolutely. it's how we and how we make it's how we make changes right and just like we were like we were talking about how the levels of representation or not dealing with things early on, even like on Guiding Light or something by not hitting those things. Well, we're now at a point where we are addressing a lot of different things mm -hmm. across the board, you know, front, behind, in administrations, in, you know, decision yeah. makers, every, every, so, so the, you know, if it, you know, it took something as crazy as 2020 to shift the paradigm in so many different ways, you know, that, you know, we, I guess we have to be thankful for those who sacrifice willingly and unwillingly um, for us to go through this. But the important thing is going through it so that we do arrive at something else, something better, something greater with a higher level of understanding, of sensitivity, of some level of spiritualness uh, and just awareness you know the fact that we can just have these conversations and whether you're standing in line with a mask on your face somewhere else and suddenly you can have a conversation with someone and it doesn't have to be tense in the same way because everybody's going you know what shit we've all been through oh <laughs> that, that we you know man this year has has it has been a meeting on all of us in some way or another that man we are everybody is you know 
more or less at least half the country is saying that, you know, we want to be on this ride together to get to something better. It's true. Um, I want to ask about so many roles you've had. Um, Victoria, you've done so many primetime things. I remember screaming. My husband and I were downstairs when Hawaii Five O came on, and there you were with <laughs> Scott Kahn and Alec McLaughlin. Do you have a favorite? I mean, you, you really, I mean, so much. Do you have a favorite role that you've yeah. tackled in primetime? Uh, that's a hard one. That's right. That's right. That's or, or maybe it doesn't. NCIS it, is, it, yeah. But, I mean, I. it was so much fun. It was so like there, it was just a convergence of all of my favorite things. The only thing I needed that would have made it like I probably my head would have exploded is if I got to be an alien on that show. But but uh, it was that I got to do everything in my wheelhouse. I got to cry. I got to do heavy dialogue. I got to work in a group in sort of an ensemble kind of way. I got to run and be physical um, it show all of this power, but show all of this vulnerability at the same time. And I was working on, I mean, my gosh, it's NCIS. They've been around for 18 years. And she, stole Mark, and she stole Mark Harmon's jacket. That's not true. But that's the other thing. <laughs> both of you, you have, you both have worked with so many great actors in these uh -oh. roles. Is besides oh NCIS and Mark Harmon, who I'm sure ain't bad. Are any other favorite people you got to work with? Oh my gosh, there are so many. I mean, I I go all the way back to when I was a kid, because that because now I look at that and I, and I go, oh my gosh, I worked with Dexter Gordon when I was a kid. Joe I DiMaggio. With, I worked with Joe DiMaggio. Get out. Commercial. Crazy. For, I, I was for, like. For, for what? Those, those hangling earrings? Those hanging earrings? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it was, for, it was for a Chase Manhattan Bank commercial. <laughs> oh, okay. Wasn't he in Yankee? Joe? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, one of the great yeah. Yankees. Yeah. 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 Oh, and my awesome. father, who was a diehard Met fan, because you know, <laughs> you're from Queens and Brooklyn, so you got to be a Met fan. Um, but when I was uh, shooting this commercial, my father sat in the car the whole time. They were like, oh, Mr. Platt, you can go home. He was like, no, no, it's OK. <laughs> He's like watching us in this commercial. He's totally well, just that's the best. That's the best thing as a, you know, yeah. as a child, you, you know, you can do for your yeah. parents. Yeah. I work with Martin Scorsese. Isn't that insane? Did you, did you know that? He shot the commercial? No. Martin Scorsese was in a film as an actor called Round Midnight oh, that Bertrand Tavernier directed. Wow. And I remember my parents were, of course, like, I know you don't understand this. But Martin <laughs> Scorsese, just be around him as much as you can and ask as many questions as you can. <laughs> so what's your favorite color? They were like, that's not what we meant. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it was wow. funny. and for you, a lot, lots. Yeah, I mean that's I I know both of you. I'm like just looking at all the reels and all the casts. It's quite impressive, you know. Felicia Rashad, and, like I, now you you have me thinking, and it's like all of these right, people rolling. I mean, we have before, to, you know, the memory. Until somebody puts something in front of you, I forget too. So many things. Yes, you know, know. Somebody might say, "Do you remember that person was on Guiding Light?" I said, "No, I don't." You know. It, yeah. You Speaking know. of Ruby D, I worked with Ruby D on this random hip hop film, which I can't remember. Beach Street, or I think it was called Beach Street. It was that must have been about, cool, though. It was crazy. Now that I knew who Ruby D was, I was old enough to know who people were then. But yeah, all right, your turn because I could just keep going. I'm impressed to be able to work with her. Oh, geez. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I got to be honest. All right, um, everyone do the collective. Uh, <laughs> 19 years. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. Fun ride. Um, no, I, I, I don't, you know, thank you. Every time I think of someone, then I think of someone else. I think what I'm... I think what I think of more so of what is the the generosity of mm -hmm. the actors that I've worked with, the people that I thought, you know, 
could be one way and they've turned out another way. And, you know, most of them have been great rides, you know, every which way across the board, you know, so many different people. So I, I think more so it's going, man, they were so cool. Mm -hmm. Like whoever it was. And I remember asking some other friends of mine, you know, 20, 30 years ago when they were working all the time in television or something, I'd ask them about some, man, how was it working with? They were like, oh, they were cool. You know, and that's, I, I think at the end of the day for me now, it's the humanity of the people. You know, mm -hmm. it's not about the trailer, the chair, nothing. Now I just go, man, they were cool people to work with. They were great. They welcomed me aboard. They made me feel like part of the team for how for a short amount of time I was there, what have you. And then you just move on from there. You pack your stuff up, you leave, you go, but you look around. On to the next one. <laughs> yeah. On the next one. But at the same time, at the same time, you look and go, man, I could I could ride this one out with this one for some time, but if not, you pack your stuff and you get in your car and you drive home and you come home and start cooking or cleaning the house because <laughs> you know you got the kid here. Mm -hmm. You know you walk in and the dog is jumping on you and the kid is grabbing you and all that, and you go, "This is just as great." Well, one of uh, our fans, Luther, sent me a link to the DL Chronicles because he said yeah. your performance was so great in that, and I watched it Thank last you. night. So Loved it. Thank you. Loved Thank it. You. I had never, I'd never heard of it, but it was, it was oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. I did that about I think, 15, 16 years ago. Uh, somewhere. Wow. About. Yeah. As and a matter of fact, our host, your co-star is lives across the street from us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so strange. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we became friends after that, and yeah, then absolutely. when we, when when Vic found this house, as we were driving around here, I was going, "Hey, you know, my buddy Kareem, he lives in this neighborhood. He, Kareem, I think he lives on this block. Oh my God, Kareem lives across the street, <laughs> you know." But no, that was um, I like to. I've always been the person that wants to take on the role that nobody else wants to do. Um, somebody, something that's challenging, that has a heartbeat to it, heart, heartbeat to it, and and that's saying something within it. So that was something, and, I, and I'll tell you the reason why I, I, I took that is because I had seen Brokeback Mountain. And I said, wow, if these two guys can be that courageous to show mm -hmm. that kind of love on screen, as much as so many people were looking at me like, man, I don't think you should do that or whatever. It was, I run towards things that I think most people run away from because if it, there's a level of defiance, something unapologetic within it, but again, that has a heartbeat to it, and that's honest, and it's, um, yeah. That's it's even more that's interesting about. knowing that it's that long ago now, because it, you know that was a different time 15 years ago. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. To totally. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanna talk about the, the businesses. Um, Oh, you have curated over 50 major art exhibitions. You opened Tilford Art Group in 99, opened your first commercial space in LA in 2003, and you rebranded to Band Devices. How did you get or fall so in love with art? I've been collecting art since I was... Mm. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> he no. gets very emotional. Really? My family calls him Crybaby. <laughs> 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 I mean, I've been collecting since, since or my husband says happy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I've been collecting since I was 16 years old, and it's just been a labor of love for me, Alan. It's just um, my relation to visual artists, and it really started with me wanting to help visual artists uh, make a living in the same way that people supported Vic and I as actors, and that really started with people writing letters. And, you know, we do plays; people would come out to it. You know, so it. it it's a labor of love that turned into that has now turned into a major um, empire, if you will. In fact, like as soon as we get off here, I have to jump on with Apple TV because we're uh, entering into uh, a potential project with them uh, as well. So it's just it's been crazy. It's been crazy. It's been that, awesome. That, it's been wonderful. About what like, uh, social justice uh, as it relates to art? Uh, I would say civil rights, and then they'll sue me after that, so I can't say anything else. <laughs> just yet. And I'm, yeah, I'm not being cryptic. It's, it's the truth. No, I understand. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, amazing. But, um, we, it's, it, I've been, we've been very fortunate to catch the eye of a lot of, um, you know, we just did a, a situation with Zoom and Time Magazine. Um, Ava DuVernay has filmed in our gallery. Um, 
a, a lot of a lot of really awesome things. And then it, it for me, the awesome thing is that it just goes back to the very beginning is sought to do something on behalf of visual artists. It's remain honest and it's, you know, manifest. Spencer, you. He's also an artist. He won't say that. that, but that I want that. That was going to be my question. Have you been drawing or painting since you were 16 or what have you been doing? I, I, I sort of did, but once I really took the company to a different phase around 2003, I kind of stopped painting around 2010, um, but I've never used the gallery to promote my own work. Do you sell your own work, I hope? No. How come? Uh, it's a little bit more personal, and okay. uh, it, it, but also I am developing something that's a three-part, it's a three-tier uh, art project that will hopefully see the light of day sometime next year, which it includes uh, a book, a theatrical component, as well as a visual component as well. Amazing, amazing. Do you have a favorite piece of his? I do. Um, let's see, I've got a couple. <laughs> There's one that he did of, actually it was of me. That was of me with um, with a really long neck. Yeah. It was like a Modigliani <laughs> painting. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that. that one is one of my favorites, but then he also does collage. And there was one that, uh, interestingly enough, dealt with civil rights and the challenges of uh, people in black bodies. And um, mm. I don't know the name of it, but, I, but I, that's one of my favorites as well. Well, privately, you can send me pictures. I'd love to see some of these. <laughs> okay, yes, I'll send you pictures. I, I would, I would <laughs> love, seriously, I, I, I remember art very much so, and I remember Rutgers very much. You must, we must have talked a lot about Rutgers I don't remember why exactly, but I, I know you talked about Rutgers a lot when you were at Getting Light Terrell. Um, and Victoria, tell me about this. I elevate me. Oh, wow. You got all the information. Right, hitting all the marks. <laughs> so um, in 2014, uh, because I was pregnant at the time, I decided to get certified in an energy balancing and mindfulness therapy. And, and what, what does that exactly mean? So. so Energy balancing and mindfulness are basically tools that you use to keep your nervous system calm and relaxed so that no matter what situation you're in, you don't get into fight, flight, or freeze, which is the thing that causes trauma, basically. And it doesn't allow you to um, operate out of your highest and best self. So whenever we feel um, afraid or like we don't belong, we feel unsafe, we feel like some people don't like us, or we're not included in the group, we start operating out of traumas, which doesn't allow us to have full expression of ourselves and have joy um, and meet people with engagement. Cause then we're all here, like trying to fix whatever is going on. So if you've heard of Reiki, which is an energy mm -hmm. balancing, a different energy balancing modality, what I do is similar to that. Um, but it goes further in that it deals directly with the, um, with the nervous system and healing trauma in the nervous system so that we can operate out of the best version of ourselves. It just keeps you present and available um, without feeling uh, judged and that safety and feeling of uh, compassion for yourself actually zooms out into the world and it can shift the places that you're in. Well, I love the, the first thing you said about the flight and the, you know, the nervous system, you know, cause we all, you know, especially 2020 has definitely elevated all of our nervous systems quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yeah, they're, they're really, we're looking in the work that I do, which is a, a whole community. I mean, my business is just me, but I work with a lot of other practitioners and we are starting to talk about what it means 2020 to have this year, seeing it down the line and what we can start preparing for in terms of what's going to show up because the, reason trauma happens is not because of fight flight. The reason trauma happens is because fight flight can't engage. So when we feel unsafe, when we feel like we're not included or that people don't like us, we either want to fight or we want to run. But as adults, we don't do that. We stay in it because we either need to be in there for a job or we need, it's a relationship or whatever. And so what happens because we can't run or fight, we dissociate. That's the freeze response. It's the freeze response that causes the trauma. Hmm. And so first, everyone's going to need to thaw out in 2020. 
You're not kidding. And we got to look at what that means and how that will start to, um, how that will show up for people in different, um, particularly we're looking at people in service industries, people who are working with others, people who are working with the virus directly, first responders, um, essential workers. And they're in situations where they're really afraid, but they can't do anything about it, either because of money or, because, you know, because you have to make a living, got to pay the bills. Uh, just our regular, we go out into the world and there's a level of fear that we're carrying that causes trauma. So we're looking at ways in which we can begin to prepare and um, get ahead of some of the traumas that we're going to see and try and head them off. Giving So I'm teaching um, and co-facilitating rather uh, courses in mindfulness and self-regulation tools so that we can be more aware of where, what we're being in the moment. And just that awareness can sometimes shift the level of trauma that you experience. Did you learn about this by taking something yourself or reading about it? How did you come across? All of, all of it, really. Um, I, when I first took this certification in 2014, I started taking clients on an individual basis, just doing energy balancing and mindfulness. And then a lot of research started coming out about the vagus nerve and about nervous systems and how trauma actually is not in the mind, it's in the body. And um, so when you go to therapists who mostly deal with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is CBT, where you're talking out your issues, that deals with a piece of it. But I was really, really interested in the places that are not being addressed, right? Which is the spiritual and the physical. So we can have the energetic, but then there's the, the physical and the spiritual piece that I was really interested in. Where does trauma land in the body? So when um, People talk about, you know, I've been in therapy for 20 years and mm -hmm. these three things will not change. I cannot get anything, cannot make any headway in them. Then it's not in the cognitive, it's not in the mind then, it's somewhere else. And that's what I was interested in, is how do I um, find ways to address all three? So we hit mind, body, and spirit. And so I became a minister in 2017 through my church. Oh. Um and uh, really started, uh, and also I was a yoga teacher. I was, I was teaching yoga in 2005, but that was not as lofty an experience. <laughs> I Amazing. did that because I hate working out. <laughs> I, I, I love what actors end up doing. You know, I think I told Terrell, do you remember Bill Buemiller? Oh yeah. Uh, oh, got, yeah of he, he, he became a therapist out in California and has a successful cra crazy oh, business. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. Yeah. And oh, Bill was really just crazy. like you guys are so easy to talk to. You know, I think that's why we all got Bill was somebody I always could just talk talk right. to. But, but amazing. Crazy. My last question, and I, I know you guys have to run. What um crazy time pandemic? What did you learn about yourself during this time that you didn't already know? You want this to be quick? Oh. <laughs> There's a long um, list. There is a long list. Do you want to start? Oh, no. Yeah. No, that's why. I, I I think that, that says it. We because we do. You know, it teaches you a lot. Yeah. Like this, it does. I think, though, I know I'm already. I feel like I'm a, a very passionate person. I think I just I try to take as much attention off of myself and to find ways I could be in service of other people. Um, I think, you know, when you're when when the world is responding to things the way that it is, you just look to other people and go, what can I do for you? What do you need right now? And that's I think that's something that even selfishly helped me to move through this as well as to not sit, not just sit in my own stuff about it, but going, what's the best way I could be active to participate and still be helpful at the same time. I think the piece for me was um, how resilient I am, but also how much I judge the small pieces of myself that I don't like and how I hadn't synthesized those. And I kept trying to get rid of them and fix them. Um, and instead during this time, because all we're doing is sitting with ourselves, um, is I decided to actually integrate them and process them. And now I don't see them as pieces of myself that I don't like. They make me laugh sometimes, but I've started seeing those things that I don't like about myself as actually the, the, 
kind of the gateway to really amazing gifts that I have. And that's awesome. Just loving myself more. And then ipso facto loving other people more because I'm not judging myself so harshly. So I'm not judging everyone around me as harshly. And it just makes for a much more joyful experience. You guys, I can't tell you how happy today has made me. Seeing oh. you and spending time with you has really me made me very happy. Wishing you Same. the best of holidays. Take care of that little girl. Hopefully yes. when this is all over, I can give you all a big hug in person in California. Yes. And, yes, and no, text me. I want to see some of his. I want to see some of his art. <laughs> I will send. I won't I'll send it, pictures. I swear. I won't. I'll send pictures. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all of you out there. Thanks for yeah, tuning they, in. Yeah, we'll meet you. They've all said they really enjoyed this conversation. As oh, wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll meet you. We'll meet you in the locker room anytime. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, when, when you have something else to talk about, let's do it. Let's right. do it. Okay. Next time we need a little steam. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and here we go. Bye, guys. Great place to end. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Thank Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Terrell, for for being here. I really. Uh, amazing show. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet to my channel, you can do it right below. Um, don't forget to set the notification so you get notified of all the upcoming shows. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and I will see you the next time. Oops,